What I'd like to talk about is indeed uh, variational algorithms. So I guess my talk is uh, really ideas that are relevant for the NISC era rather than the era of full fault, uh, quantum fault tolerance. Now I should apologize if I'm a little bit more incoherent than usual. It's the result of two nights of having someone or something in the room next to me snoring enormously loudly and in, in irregular fashion the likes of which I haven't actually experienced since I was a kid and I lived on a farm. So um, it's been pretty rough, and uh, if I say things out of order, then you'll know the reason why. Um, here's my group, and uh, in particular, here are the individuals which are at large in this very conference. So if you look around, you may spot one or two of them. Uh, the guy on uh, your right, Tyson, is over here, also on your right, my left. He's just turned up so that he can help out anyone who's interested in the simulator stuff I'm going to show you. So, the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about are this scenario where we have a small but potentially powerful quantum computer, which we might think of as a quantum coprocessor, and it is being managed and controlled by a classical machine that does a non-trivial amount of the, of the heavy lifting. We have a circuit inside our quantum computer that has a bunch of gates uh, that might be hundreds or thousands of gates in a really interesting situation. And we assume that each one of these gates has a classical parameter that controls what it actually does. We can think of these parameters as angles, so we might say that when the parameter is uh, zero, then the gate actually doesn't act at all and is essentially the identity matrix. And then when the angle is, let's say, pi, we uh, take it that the gate has its full force so that this RZ operation, for example, would be the uh, Pauli Z operator in that case. But crucially, we can continuously, or at least in a fine granular way, adjust this setting. We don't adjust it while the algorithm is running, but it allows us to adapt the circuit from one execution to the next. And then we have a belief. We believe that if we could find the right set of parameters, this circuit will do something useful. It might map the input state, and throughout my talk, the input state is simply um, the all zero state, onto something as an output state that we care about. It might be the representation of the ground state of a molecule in some picture um, that we care about for quantum chemistry reasons, or many, many other applications, some really surprisingly diverse ones that I'll mention later on. But the challenge, of course, is how to find the set of parameters for which this little quantum circuit does this wonderful task. There may be um, hundreds or thousands of parameters, and whilst it's just a classical search space, that's still intractable by a sort of uh, naive brute force, force method, so we need to do better. Um, with that in mind, here's the structure of my talk. I'm going to say a word about the tools that my group has developed that allow us to look at things numerically and just try stuff out, which is really invaluable when we're trying to understand the potential for the NISC era. And then I'm going to uh, set up a little toy model uh, of exploring a, a, a circuit, an ANSATS, and use that to motivate imaginary time as a strategy, which we've put a lot of work into. And that will lead us into thinking about smart ways to tolerate errors without additional resource costs in these sort of scenarios. Um, because of time constraints, I'll relegate just to remarks some uh, comments about the full breadth of things that we can attack with this kind of approach, including linear algebra problems, completely general evolutions, and circuit recompilation. And I'll finish up with a tantalizing thing that's hot off the press regarding metrology. Okay, so first, uh, QUEST, which stands for Quantum Exact Simulation Toolkit. Um, that is uh, something that my group has been developing for some years, and it is the, the go-to set of tools that we use when we want to figure out how um, a, a, a system of less than 40 or so qubits um, works. At its core, it's a bunch of C code that um, anyone who can program C, not necessarily an expert, will be freely able to use, and the system facilitates the use of uh, GPUs or exotic scenarios like uh, a whole bunch of separate computers that are hooked up in a network, maybe in your university, um, where you want to represent a quantum state that's too big to fit in any one of them. Quest knows how to do all these things so that you don't have to know. You simply write a simple code, high-level code, and compile it to the different targets. 
So um, that's pretty useful, but there's still a bit of an entry barrier there. You have to know how to program in C, which isn't the friendliest thing. So an enormous uh, step forward has been um, taken by uh, Tyson in the last year or so, who has figured out how to use uh, Mathematica as essentially the front end to Quest. And this uh, makes it really very nice. And I hope, if things work out, that I'll show you a live demo of that presently. But let me emphasize this uh, website here. It just says Quest Link. Q Tech Theory with no U in it, dot org. So that's a subsite of our group's website. Let me um, flip over to it now and just show you, uh, see if I can tantalize you and tempt you into visiting this website. Um, you will find here uh, some little demos. And if you have Mathematica on your laptop, it's as simple as clicking the tutorial at, and, uh, and exploring away. Um, Moreover, you can just take these two uh, lines of voodoo and put them at the start of any Mathematica notebook, and it will upgrade it into being a Mathematica notebook that can do all the stuff that I'm about to show you. So that's enough about Quest for now. Let's think about a toy model to motivate this uh, desire that we have to find the sweet spot of uh, configurable circuit. So this really is a toy. It's the smallest thing I, we could think of that involves more than one qubit. We have a Hamiltonian, and of course, there's no real challenge here because we can immediately see that uh, the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian are the computational basis states, and the eigenvalues are 1, 2, 3, and 0, the ground state. Still, suppose that we wanted to find that in some systematic way that hopefully can scale to much more fearsome problems. So here we have our little circuit, which we call the ANSATS, and it has just two gates in it, each of which takes a parameter, a rotation around X, and a controlled rotation around Y. We're feeding in the 0, 0, but that's not the ground state which we want to find. Well, this is uh, the energy landscape that we get as a function of those two parameters, and right in the middle, which is at the value both parameters are set to pi, we see there is, there's the minimum that we would like to get to. So it's easy to intuitively see what's happening there. Of course, we're just flipping the first qubit full force, and then we're uh, applying this controlled y rotation again full force to get from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Um, but how, how would we get do that systematically? So uh, generally, if you see something like this, you would call it a cost function that you want to find the minimum of, and the natural thing is to do gradient descent. So I'll talk about that just briefly. It's, of course, very, very well explored in the literature. So what that would mean is that we're taking our set of parameters and we're updating them incrementally, step by step. And in each step, we update them by going in a certain direction in parameter space. And what is that direction? It's simply the direction in which the energy is decreasing most rapidly. So to find that out, we need to figure out how is the energy changing with respect to each of the parameters. Excuse me, this should be a partial derivative here. So I'm flipping to green because this reminds me to speed up a bit. I really want to just give a sketch of how this works, but it's kind of cute, and so I wanted to run through it quickly. So we uh, want to find this uh, derivative. The first thing to say is that we assume the Hamiltonian um, is a sum, a tract, uh, you know, not uh, exponentially large sum of individual terms, and each term is just a product of Pauli operators. So for our toy model, uh, an example term might be Z1, Z2. So then the question of how to find this uh, gradient becomes, of course, just the question of how are we going to find the gradient of the expectation value of one of these simple operator uh, combos. And uh, how do we do that? Well, a simple way to do it would be finite difference. We could just set up our circuit with one set of parameters, run it a bunch of times until we finished at, or figured out this expected value, then tweak one of the parameters and run it a bunch more times until we figured out how that's changed it. But that's not a great way to do it because we would be trying to look at a small difference between two quantities that are quite time consuming to sample. So a different way to go at it is just to manipulate it a bit. So when we're remembering that these states are just the circuit re re acting on a fixed reference input state, we can just uh, chain rule this and see that it's nothing more than the real part of this little object here, which doesn't look uh, too scary. Oh, let me use the pointer. Um, we've got our circuit, we've got our little uh, set of Pauli terms, and then we have this object that's a little bit weirder looking. It's the derivative of our circuit operator with respect to the parameter we care about. What does that mean? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Our circuit is simply a product of individual gates. So when we ask for the gradient of our circuit with respect to a parameter, we simply need to focus on the relevant gate. And that's not hard. So here, for example, we take the derivative of the Rx gate. We just bring down the Pauli operator and a, a prefactor. And so it, 
the long story short is when we take the gradient of a, a circuit, we're essentially just inserting one, or as it may be a couple, depending on how this derivative comes out, of extra gates. It's just another circuit with an insertion in it. So now we can understand what these operators are. It still looks like a thing that might be a heck of a thing to evaluate experimentally. But it's of the form, uh, like this, of just two operators. Um, and we can uh, make use of a trick that's been known in the field since at least 2002, which is a, an Eckert paper, but very possibly earlier, I don't know, uh, where we essentially take a probe qubit, we introduce one more qubit, and put it in a 0 plus 1. And then we uh, have a controlled u, uh, controlled by 0, and a controlled v, controlled by 1, so that we're entangling this probe state with the main register. And then we simply measure the probe. And this uh, gives us, uh, through just a, a, a rescaling, the um, inner product that we want. And intuitively, we can see why this is. If these two operators were actually the same thing, so that this should come out as 1, then uh, we have applied it controlled on 0, and then immediately applied it controlled on 1, which means it's unconditional, so there is no entanglement. Conversely, if these two things were to create orthogonal states on the register, we have maximally entangled our probe with the register, which we then ignore, so we will have a maximally mixed state. So uh, it's pretty straightforward. It still doesn't sound great to an experimentalist because it sounds like what we need to do is um, either have a control, this whole thing, the circuit with an inserted extra gate, or this other thing, the circuit followed by our Pauli operators. And that would be nasty to have to make all this structure conditional on the probe. However, we don't really need to do that because if we think about it, the circuit is happening in both cases and all that's really changing is either we insert the extra gate or we perform the Hamiltonian term. So it's a really a very clean and simple circuit, scarcely more complex than the ability to run the circuit on the register itself. So that was just a little quick uh, illustration that some of the objects that we end up writing down look like they might be experimentally a bit fearsome to evaluate, but they're not. Um, by the way, you can even get rid of the probe, although then the story is a bit less intuitive to follow. Okay, so let's come back to our toy model and suppose that we make those measurements and we find out the gradient and we follow it. What do we see? Well, here we see uh, a uh, simple gradient descent exactly as we would wish it. We start up here and we end up down there. However, it doesn't always work out. Here we uh, start from a range of starting points and we see that sometimes we get stuck in this trench because it has zero gradient. Now, uh, there's an enormous literature on optimization problems, which this becomes. And, of course, this is just the naive first idea, so you can immediately see how you might modify this algorithm. You could say, oh, if I get stuck in an area with no gradient, I will start again, or I will roam around at random. You can immediately upgrade this. You can look at um, higher curvatures, all sorts of things. But what I'd like to suggest is we go back to the beginning and see if we can come at the problem from a different direction and find a complementary technique for getting to the ground state. And that leads to um, an idea that is uh, already um, well established in the classical literature, for example, in quantum chemistry. We do an imaginary time evolution. So we write down an equation like this, which looks very much like the normal time evolution equation, except we're missing off the eye. We can imagine it's been absorbed into the tau. This thing, uh, does not conserve uh, normalization, so we put a factor in front to recover that. But what it's trying to do is constantly kill the state. Um, it's attenuating it exponentially, depending on the energy, what it sees. So if we imagine expanding this in the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, this thing will kill off most aggressively the high energy terms, less aggressively the low energy terms, and if, say, the ground state is zero for simplicity, it will leave that one alone. So this thing will distill down to the um, state that we actually want. We can put it into a differential form when it looks very much like the Schrodinger equation uh, like this, and then we can say, well, where are we going next? What we do is bring both these terms to the right-hand side, so it should be equal to zero, look at the trace norm of that to make it a scalar, and then say, I would like to vary my parameters in such a way that uh, this remains minimized. So that's um, the McLaughlin variational technique, very, very uh, standard technique from the literature. So I won't take you through going, doing that, but it's not challenging. It's an undergraduate task to just work this out. It's just a bunch of differentials that you cancel and collect up. And we end up with a very nice picture. Instead of what we had before, this again is the simple gradient descent where this vector points straight down in energy. We have something else, which looks like this. It's the same equation, but we have a little insertion here, which is uh, an, the inverse of a matrix. And what is that matrix? It's this object. 
It's simply all possible combinations of how the state changes when you twiddle knob i versus how, how the state changes when you t twiddle knob j. Um, so this is a, an entity which has no dependence on the Hamiltonian, no dependence on the particular problem you're trying to solve. It's all about the ansatz and the particular point in the parameter space you are at. Uh, but we actually need the inverse of that matrix, so there's some work to be done. The quantum system will give us this matrix, and the classical machine will have to invert it. It's easy to calculate this thing, despite looking a bit exotic. This is exactly the same arguments I just showed you show us that uh, we simply need to have a couple of gate insertions into our standard circuit controlled by a probe. Okay, so, oh, and I should mention, it's cheaper than you might think to evaluate this. You might say, well, this is now a very fancy approach, isn't it? Because instead of having to work out a vector, we're now having to work out a whole damn, damn matrix Dang, I meant to say, <laughs> a whole dang matrix, um, and that seems like it's going to be much more expensive. But remember that in order to get each term of this gradient vector, we have to um, move along the sum of terms in the Hamiltonian. And it may well be that there are more terms in the Hamiltonian than there are parameters in the ansatz, in which case it's actually more expensive to get that vector than it is to get our matrix. And a further remark, which is purely an empirical one, is that we find that the matrix can be known less accurately than the gradient vector, and it still works well. So actually, what I would say in many cases, to do this fancier approach is less than double the effort of doing the simple approach, to put it in crude terms. Okay, and let's see how that uh, acts on our toy problem. So, well, it fixes it. Instead of getting stuck in this zero gradient, it no longer just cares about the gradient, um, we can actually uh, find our way downhill um, to the um, true minimum. Okay, let's look at now at a live simulation. I promise to have a go at uh, showing you Quest running live. So let me see if that's gonna work out for us. Uh, move my glasses out of the way. So, uh, there's a, a lot of code here, and it may look intimidating, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of things, because it really isn't intimidating. I, I realize not everyone will be able to see this quite from the back, but here I set up a Hamiltonian in the most intuitive way possible, just listing the strengths of the terms and just writing the terms in the natural notation, Z0 meaning um, a Pauli Z operating on qubit zero. Our qubits start from zero and go one, two, three. And then, more interestingly still, here when we actually want to set up our circuit, it's again a super intuitive, symbolic way of doing it. It's not a, what you would expect to see if you program emulators. Here we see RZ subscript one on an angle. That simply means one of our R rotations on qubit one by this angle. And that's it. That's how I specify a um, circuit in uh, Quest or Quest Link. Very nice, and we can also go ahead and draw it. The little extra lines of voodoo at the beginning of this notebook simply upgrade Mathematica so it has this extra language, um, which is all Tyson's work, I reiterate. So then I'm going to go ahead and just execute the next few lines without comment because they uh, just clutter up the screen. I will show you, oh, I'm on the wrong. Let me switch over, I think, to this one. Oh, sorry, didn't want that one. Okay, so I'll keep going. So here we have uh, a rather um, scarily large uh, ansatz, and we can uh, go ahead with these cool sliders that Tyson has put in that don't really do anything except uh, just show us that we can generate a variety of different interesting circuits. Let me just see um, what options I have here. So I'll close that. And let's see, maybe I will run yeah, this one. So here, no, I'll go back. I can't make my mind up. I'm going to try and run a small problem for you and then run a bigger one. There we go. So now we have little ansatz, a little problem. By the way, this problem that we're looking at is a real one. It's solving for the ground state of the hydrogen molecule. So you see I'm just executing through. Oh, another thing to highlight is that if we want to, we can uh, very simply in Mathematica just compile circuits. So here's a compilation happening. The circuit on the left is the raw version, and the circuit on the right is what you get when you note that uh, some of the gates can't possibly affect the output qubit that we're interested in. And of course, you can do far more sophisticated compilation than that. Uh, everything is just very cleanly represented symbolically. So let me execute a bunch more of these lines. And then let's see if it's going to work for us. So here we start off. We're going to start off from a random point, And it's not. That's fantastic. <laughs> let me execute the whole thing again. I've probably missed off one of the terms that I would like to run here. So we're just going to go through and blindly execute each one of these things again. 
Yes, thank goodness. All right, so indeed I just missed off one of those lines. Now, this jumping up is actually an instability in the numerical solver, the classical computer's part of the workload, um, and we can get rid of it just by having a more fancy matrix inverter, but it's quite fun to leave it in there to remind me to say that we need to do this. And we can go ahead and run a bunch, starting from different cases. In each case, we find the ground state. You may be able to see there's a red line here that represents the ground state we're seeking. So that's fine. Gradient descent is, uh, excuse me, imaginary time is reliably fine this for us. Uh, in this version, we mimic exactly what the experimentalist would do, which is great because we can put in noise models and see what effect they have. We can also just cut the experimentalist out of the story and access the state more directly, uh, which will simply give us, I think, a more rapid uh, calculation. So here we're doing 20 or so different cases very, very quickly by accessing the state in a more direct way. So I realize there's a lot of code on the screen, but I emphasize that um, the way to use it is very, very clean and simple because you just set up the circuit that you want and then you just call for Quest to evaluate it. And now I will uh, tempt fate by switching over to this other one, uh, which is a um, somewhat more uh, chunky application, where now we're looking at lithium hydride. And again, I've just got all my tasks. My simple task, which I, which I messed up last time, was to just execute each one of these lozenges. And we're simply going to find out really whether I've managed to execute them all or not. Here we go. And I have. So uh, now we have a much slower evolution, which uh, gives me the chance to say, whilst it's coming along here, that it's slow because it's using my laptop. But this same nice, clean front end will work if we're run running the actual Quest code on uh, a GPU in my office or on the university's cluster, at which point everything will be the same for the user, but this process will just go far more rapidly. So. Um, here we have uh, got ourselves, it will eventually get out, but it, it, we've got ourselves um, stuck in a state that's um, not quite the ground state. So I'm not going to, because it takes a while, I'm not going to run this over and over again. If you're interested, come up and see me and we can run this a few times. But the message I want to give you is that this emulator is able to um, provide us with extremely clean and simple and intuitive ways of exploring the, uh, I'm tempted to do it, but I'm not going to do it. Right, let's just leave that running in the background and get on with my talk. So, uh, with that kind of tool available, what sort of uh, things do we discover? So, here is the summary of um, exactly the line of research that I was showing you in that uh, quick live demo. Um, if we go ahead and look at a large number of cases and compare imaginary time with gradient descent, we find simple gradient descent. We find that imaginary time is um, far outperforms it. It gives us much more rapidly as the solution and it gives us much more accurately the solution. Um, and let me uh, show you another instance of imaginary time doing great. If we want to find the entire low-lying spectrum of a system rather than just the ground state, how would we do that, by the way? What, well, we have these uh, approaches available to us that allow us to find the ground state, but having found it, we now want to find uh, an excited state. What we would do formally is we would say, well, let's try and remove the ground state from the Hamiltonian by introducing a new term that increases the energy of the ground state so that now that particular level has been taken up in the spectrum, but the others are still where they were, and now the new ground state will be the first excited state. That sounds like a rather complex process in general, but of course, because we are describing this all with our classical parameters, we need not really modify the Hamiltonian. All we need to do is modify the rules that we use for updating our parameters. And so, in fact, we can very efficiently attempt this. This is something that was observed by us, but, but also by a Cambridge team. Uh, before us, I should say. But uh, we tried this out with imaginary time, and we found that it works very, very cleanly. So here we're finding the ground state, and then we restart, having banned the ground state, and we find an excited state, then we restart, having banned that state, and so on. Uh, this is how imaginary time obtains the spectrum. If we use great simple gradient descent, it uh, starts off looking pretty good, but the small errors accumulate and we end up with a nonsense spectrum. So on the left, we have very cleanly discovered the spectrum, and on the right, we end up with a lot of fictitious levels after a while. Um, maybe it's a good time to mention that uh, we only have a limited understanding of why imaginary time seems to do a better job of finding these, these interesting uh, minima than simple gradient descent. What imaginary time is doing 
is it's taking the uh, trajectory that you would like to take through Hilbert space following the uh, imaginary time decay process and projecting it into the space that you can reach with your ansatz. Um, so we, that's what it's doing, but why it is that that seems empirically to perform much more cleanly than gradient descent is something that we don't have a full picture of, and I would I'd be very happy to discuss why that might be. All right, so now, having looked at the kinds of things we do, it's time to think about how errors um, might spoil the process. So the internet teaches us that there's often one simple trick to deal with something. I'm constantly being asked to click on these things. But there is one simple trick that's very, very helpful in the kinds of circuit that I've shown you. Uh, perhaps don't look at the clutter on the right, just look at this very simple figure here. So uh, we're trying to measure the expected value of some parameter, as you saw, like a specific qubit that we're interested in. And here is um, uh, this horizontal axis represents how much noise we have in our system in the sense of gate errors, for example. So one means you have turned down the gate errors to the, in your system to the lowest level you can manage. Maybe if you're a, a world-leading iron trap group, that's 10 to the minus 3 error rate on your most tricky gates. And naively, what you would do is just run your apparatus in the mode that is the best you can achieve. You will measure some expected value out of that noisy circuit, and that's it. You know, you say, well, I'll power on with that. Hopefully, the answer will be good enough. But instead of doing that, what you, we would argue you should do is sample half the time at this point. Let's say you're willing to do, I don't know, 10,000 um, runs of your system. So run 5,000 at that point, and then deliberately make the errors worse, counterintuitive as that sounds. Deliberately uh, don't alter the nature of the noise, but allow it to be more severe, and do it again. And you will find a new expected value for your observable, um, because your, gate, your circuit has now changed. But what you will do is, extrapolate through the two points, or here three, that you've measured in order to take a guess, just a guess, at what would happen if you were able to have an error-free circuit. So it's about the simplest possible idea that you could try as a low-level hack for estimating the impact of noise and removing it. Uh, and so let me fly through to this. I should mention that we, we, we proposed this idea uh, essentially um, instantaneously with this uh, uh, team from IBM. And their paper, however, had a second idea in it, which is very beautiful, called quasi-probability. Um, but I won't talk about that now. I will mention that the extrapolation method, this very, very simple notion, has now been successfully demonstrated, for example, by the IBM team in this Nature paper that came out earlier this year. Really, really nice. And it shows that they were able, for a small molecule like the ones we were just looking at, to get chemical precision um, with extrapolation where it would have been impossible without. So this extrapolation principle is really, really nice. Uh, we might ask, however, um, how it, does it work as systems get larger? So with our emulators, we can go to up to 40 qubits, perhaps. Here we're looking at 19 qubits, and it works very nicely. Uh, these, this data shows what the experimentalist will believe is the expected value of our parameter, as it might be one of these gradients that we're chasing, um, after having uh, run their apparatus 10,000 times. So the real answer, by the way, is 0.5, where that little red arrow is. If the extrapolation or other mitigation techniques are not used, uh, you'll get quite a nice narrow distribution after 10,000 samples, but sadly, it's completely in the wrong place. If we use these mitigation techniques, and so perhaps now come down to these bottom two, the, put the pink and the green lines are the two different techniques that we were examining in this paper. Um, we find that we correctly recover the right average, although now we have a broader range, a higher variance. So after 10,000 experiments, the experimentalist may um, guess any one of these. Uh, the solution to that is just to sample more, but that's where the cost of this process is hiding. In order to get um, the ideal, which would be a nice sharp distribution like this, but positioned right in the center, we now have to sample many more times. And we can have a look at, so you would be crazy not to do this, because, um, <laughs> yeah, because you know, uh, it's not costing you anything. You don't need any more qubits, and in these diagrams, we're comparing the same number of runs on your device. So it's clearly better to be sampling from this distribution, if the real answer is 0.5, than this completely inaccurate distribution. So there's no downside to doing this, except that um, it's, not, uh, it's not a silver bullet, it's not going to solve the problem, because if you have a lot of noise, you'll have to sample a heck of a lot to have the same performance as the ideal circuit. 
Um, let's skip through that and on to here. Um, this is, uh, I know it's a little bit uh, small for people at the back, but let me come and um, point out, let me read it off to you. This is assuming that we have a dense circuit, so all the qubits are active in every round, and here's our number of qubits from 10 through to 80. And this is the multiplicative factor. How many more times do you have to run your experiment to get the same quality of information out that you would have got if the circuit was perfect? Now, we need an error rate, and the error rates for these two curves, there's just two different error models, the error rates for these curves correspond to one part in 10 to the 3, which is basically the record set by iron trappers, two or three groups now. And what we see is this uh, rather depressing exponential increase. When we're out in the post-supremacy regime of about 80 qubits, we have something like 10 to the 8 as a prefactor, even 10 to the 9. So we need to run it a billion more times to extract that out. On the other hand, if we can manage to get a 10 times lower error rate, uh, which is not out of the question, there are iron trap groups that are now chasing that, then this is much more reasonable um, at this level. So it's, of course, very sensitive to the native error rate, and you're looking at a prefactor of less than 10. So, um, there's some hope that this simple technique alone might help us to get value out of these uh, variational circuits, but it doesn't look fantastic. However, we can add in extra tricks on top. So here's a trick that um, Sam in my group uh, cooked up, but simultaneously various other groups have thought of equivalent things. Um, what we say is, well, look, it's all about signal to noise. In fact, let me just go back from that for a moment. It's all about signal to noise, right? These extrapolation technique is really nothing more than varying the severity of the noise in the hope that the signal part of the signal plus noise becomes more apparent. In the same spirit, it would be desirable for us to be able to just throw away some of the noisy states um, because they are simply uh, degrading um, the uh, eventual output. So if we can put a filter on, that remove some of the bad cases, that will help us. It's one of the tricks that can help us get from this kind of curve to this kind of curve if we've already done the best we can, of course, in reducing the native error rate. So um, what this particular trick is, is saying, let's suppose that we're modeling something like a chemistry problem where there are inherently some conserved quantities that should be respected by the circuit if it works properly. For example, the number of electrons should not change if we're just looking at the evolution of our system in time or a gradient descent. And there may be other conserved quantities like the number of up electrons in spin versus the number of down electrons. If we check that before measuring the energy and adding it to our list of legitimate data points, then we will chuck out some of the bad cases. In this very simple case, we chuck out up to about 80% of the failure scenarios, which is essentially equivalent to lowering our gate error rate by a factor of five. And it's a very, very uh, low cost trick. It's much like, of uh, you'll have realized, um, a stabilizer on a code, right? So we check something that should have a defined value if things are working properly. The difference is we don't try in this simple approach to fix it. We just abandon that run if we see what would be a stabilizer violation. And uh, I won't take you through this, uh, this, this graph in detail. It's in this PRL if you'd like to look. But the bottom line is if we don't do any... Uh, uh, error mitigation, we get horrible data that's of no use to a chemist. If we do the kinds of extrapolation technique I just described, we get a factor of 10 improvement in the error. And then if we kick in this filtering process, we get um, well within chemical precision. So this, I think, is evocative of the, the kind of things we need to do. Tricks, one trick after another, combining tricks together, and see if we can crack down on errors sufficiently to squeeze use, use out of these um, early circuits. Okay, um, so now uh, I'm uh, going to uh, say a word or two about um, some other work that I won't have time to look at in detail. Uh, we have um, these two papers. So if you would like to see a, a, a rigorous treatment of the kind of things that I've been uh, mentioning in the slides today, then I would uh, direct you to this um, large-ish paper by Xiao, who's also um, here in the audience, that really uh, builds things up and shows you the impact of starting from different variational principles, for example. And then, combined with this second paper, we show how to do a completely general evolution, so we might be interested, as physicists, in being able to predict 
the evolution of a system that has all sorts of things going on. Open quantum systems, you know, you have energy moving backwards and forwards with an environment. Maybe it's a formalism where you would use jump operators. Can we get all that kind of good stuff into these same pictures? The answer is yes, you can, and it's explained in these two papers. And in fact, going beyond that, um, the latter paper, the middle one on this, uh, on this list, shows us how we can solve, for example, linear algebra problems. So we know that we should be able to do matrix multiplication for suitable matrices or matrix inversion problems efficiently with a full-scale quantum computer. Can we hope to gain efficiency even from these NISC machines using variational circuits? Yes, by mapping that kind of process into the same ideas of a uh, gradually evolving problem with a sort of quasi-Hamiltonian and quasi-energies, we can um, achieve that as well. So I think uh, there's a, a great diversity of applications. It's not always about finding the ground state of some molecule or material system. And down here, um, I may have, depending on the time, yeah, a chance to just show you a couple of slides on this. Uh, this is one I particularly like just because um, I put more of my personal time into it than the other two. Um, this solves the problem of circuit compilation. Um, it, so we, we might imagine that we have a circuit that we've cooked up by having uh, just a brainwave and writing it on the whiteboard, but our experimentalist colleague has um, a specific system that uses a different set of gates, including some you know, very messy looking gates that aren't at all intuitive. Uh, our experimentalist colleague has a specific uh, um, topology to the device. Only certain gates are possible directly. And so what we would like to do is take the circuit that we came up with in the first place and map it onto this alternative architecture in an efficient way. And what we can do is we can rephrase this as an energy minimization problem where essentially we take an input state that's generated by the original circuit and we try to reverse what the original circuit did and map it to the all zero state by introducing a Hamiltonian for which the all zero state um, is uh, the ground state and oh, I'm just being reminded to, I need to hurry up and finish. Um, so what we find then is we can um, transform uh, a circuit with, and there are no caveats in terms of you know, whether it's a, a, a got a lot of Clifford gates in it and so on, because it's not a classical process, it's a quantum compiler, a quantum compiler to compile a quantum circuit from one format into another. With all the caveats in terms of us only being able to classically simulate that for fairly modest circuits, although you certainly can do it, for example, for 20 qubits and, and hundreds, let's say, of gates, so you can do some pretty meaty recompilation. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, I suggest you look at this paper or ask me a question, talk to me afterwards, because since this paper, we've actually moved on quite a bit, and we're able to compile into in a zero-knowledge scenario. So um, I know the input circuit, which is unfriendly for my quantum computer. I know the building blocks that my quantum computer finds uh, natural. I don't want to make any assumption about how to combine those building blocks together and just go for it and come up with something involving those building blocks that is a compact, efficient representation of the original circuit. Not in the formal sense that I can prove that it's you know, cl epsilon close to the best circuit, but simply one that empirically does a heck of a good job in the simulations we see. So um, that said, let me move on to my last slide. This is work that um, we're preparing for the archive, but it isn't on the archive yet, so I shouldn't really uh, be going on about it, but I'm uh, finding it quite interesting and uh, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to throw it up. It's, it's my last slide because it's moving in a somewhat different direction to everything I showed you before. In the previous cases, I've been solving problems you, uh, by, f by varying the parameters in a circuit. Here, I just want to use a variational circuit um, as a way of preparing a trial state um, for a metrology problem and this is really just a trick to explore the state, the space of possible states. Um, I just want to know what kinds of states are good for metrology and uh, how do they compare with the ones that I might analytically derive. So it's, it's using it in a subtly different uh, way. And the story here is that I have a device that can prepare a quantum state. And that state it then enters a region where there is something we want to sense, generically a, a B field, and there are noise processes going on at the same time. So we had a beautiful talk on, I think it was Wednesday, although I'm reaching the point when I don't know when particular talks happened, um, where we heard that the, the right way to do this is to do error correction 
actively during the time that the state is exposed to the environment. But in fact, um, as a sort of starter project, we don't allow ourselves that, and we don't allow ourselves an ancilla. We just take the entire state that we generate and put it into the environment, get it back out, uh, evaluate a metric like the quantum Fisher information to see how, how much information that state has come back with. And uh, so I'm going to flash up some, I'm not going to talk through all of this, don't worry. But what's going on here is different possible models for what the noise might be. And the middle one is, I think, the most interesting. I should say this is uh, balance work. Uh, balance, can you put your hand up? Yes, so right at the back of the room. So if you're interested, please see that uh, chap, <laughs> chap at the back. And this is hot off the press, so we're confident in these graphs, but we haven't put it out yet. And let me draw your attention to a nice thing. Here is the classical scaling. Here is a range of quantum strategies. They do not have an exponentially improving advantage, and we know that they can't because there are uh, uh, proofs that show that's not going to be the case. But they do have a, uh, a different linear slope, which in fact indicates a gradually increasing advantage. Uh, and of particular interest, oh, getting too much of that, um, of particular interest is the fact that the state that comes out of our general state maker, our ANSAT circuit, outperforms squeezed states and GHZ states um, by a considerable margin um, and is really quite an interesting animal because this brown line represents the best state that you can make under the constraint that the state should be permutation symmetric. And, uh, the problem is completely uh, symmetric in the sense that each qubit sees the same thing and there's nothing to break the symmetry. But the states that do the best job do have uh, broken symmetry. So we're spotting what we thought was just a sort of warm-up exercise. We're already spotting some quite uh, nice things that we'd like to understand more fully. So this will be in a paper that I hope will reach the archive pretty soon, but I wanted to just finish on that to show you that uh, there are, we're finding this variational technique to be such a powerful tool whenever we want to explore uh, beyond where we can analyt analytically go. Thank you for listening, and let me finish by putting up a final slide. Um, I'm associated with a company called Quantum Motion. We're trying to recruit good people, um, theorists, experimentalists, um, people especially on the theory side who are interested in making experiments go better through error correction and mitigation. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, as whether as someone who's looking for a job or just someone who's interested in being a consultant, please do um, just see me after this. And so with that, I'll uh, finish. Thank you very much for listening. All right, so are there any questions for Simon? Thank you for the talk. Uh, so you were saying that uh, you should be crazy not to do this uh, error mitigation. Yeah, that's uh, what I claimed. Yes, uh, but I have a question. Is like in, in what a general sense, is this really something you can do? Uh, because for the IBM case, uh -huh. where they had this, all their gates sort of scale linearly with the sort of amplitude yes, of that drive, yes. right? So they I can always just make their gate sort of yeah, continuously I longer. I think I, I think I understand the question. So, you know, uh, can we actually do it? So I, I, you're right to uh, bring me up on that point. Um, this extrapolation process only works, as I've presented it, if we are able to increase the severity of at least the dominant parts of the noise whilst keeping what we might call the noise model the same. So if I said to an experiment, make that experimentalist, make that gate worse, Right? That's easy, but can you make it worse in a proportionate way? So if, for example, you had previously completely eliminated X-flip noise and got that down to zero, and now you think, well, all right, the guy wants me to make it worse, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll remove my control of that, and now some X-flip noise will happen. That's not helpful, because previously it was not a significant part of the noise, now it is, but that gives us an extrapolation that, that doesn't meaningfully um, go into the territory that we would like to span. So a couple of things to say about that. One. Just understand your noise well enough to actually do this. <laughs> and so that's not an, uh, an outlandish thing to say. The groups I know who have got incredibly low error rates, like the Oxford Iron Trappers, do understand what's going on pretty well. And they um, may indeed be able to proportionately increase the noise in the dominant thing. But the other answer to that, a uh, more general answer, is um, a s in a slide where I said, don't look at the thing on the right. But now we will look at the thing on the right. It shows you that uh, by inserting a bit of twirling, um, we can um, homogenize the noise and then guarantee that we do scale it. Now, there's always a caveat, always a trick. This would require that the twirling operations, which are typically single qubit gates from a small library of gates like the Paulis, um, 
the twirling operations themselves better not introduce a whole other kind of noise. But that's, that's a reason, or be homogeneous. But that's a reasonable assumption. It's just using single qubit gates. So either you are able to scale your noise in a natural way, just because lucky you, that's the way the noise works in your lab, or you'll need to stick in a few extra gates to homogenize it and essentially artificially boost it up that way. Okay, thank you. But I do think it's a very, very practical technique. Uh, the IBM guys did it in a particular way. Uh, Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question about the imaginary time evolution. Mm -hmm. So it appears that the uh, sample complexity scales uh, quadratically with the number of variables compared to, whereas um, the gradient estimation um, scales linearly with the number of variables. Is this correct? No. So uh, the um, let me see where I can go with this. Um, yeah, I think this is probably the most helpful slide. So uh, this, this, this is where we're comparing what it takes to do gradient descent with what it takes to do the imaginary time process. So the V object is the same in both cases. So the amount of work in evaluating that is exactly the same up to some statements about you know, how much they can tolerate um, inaccuracy in the V and essentially it's similar. The extra effort is entirely in this matrix object A and I suppose the classical effort necessary to invert it in a stable way but that we wouldn't expect that to be the, the, the limiting um, aspect. What makes it efficient um, is that, well, we're assuming, I'm assuming, that the Hamiltonian is some set of terms, of tri trivial terms, which are um, a series of Pauli operators. If the Hamiltonian only has a few terms, then indeed there's more work to do the imaginary time vari uh, variant because this, uh, evaluating this ma A matrix will be the dominant thing. But if, as in a lot of the real examples that we look at, the Hamiltonian um, has a very large number of terms. So I know I went very quickly through our um, Mathematica simulation, but the second example I showed you had 369 terms in it. So up here we've got 369 terms. Um, that's more than the number of parameters we have. And so it's, it's that balance. If we're dealing with a very complex Hamiltonian, then actually the extra work for imaginary time is essentially incremental on the work you need to do anyway to do gradient descent. Sorry, long answer to a short question. Okay, and maybe uh, last question right down front. <coughs> Hi, thanks. Nice talk, Simon. Uh, my question is about the last part of your talk, which is maybe a little unfair since it's in progress, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, you commented that uh, you're not attempting to do any kind of error correction strategy here, but in fact, uh, this you know optimization of the preparation could be finding a code, uh, and you know could be finding a decoding strategy perhaps if you vary on the outside uh, as well. Um, I was wondering if you had the opportunity to look yet to compare to there was work I think by like Andrew Fletcher and Peter Shore like a decade ago where they found in fact for the amplitude damping channel they were able to you know do this kind of optimization find really good codes for that and I think Robert Cusset has done similar things uh, as well hmm. so I don't know if you've thought about it in the error no, uh, well, context yet. That's, that's a great comment and very helpful um, it really is work in progress I just wanted to throw it up because it's fun uh, we haven't finished why it's in progress is I mean we could do bigger simulations but we already see the interesting phenomena that we want to talk about we don't understand really what it is about the states that are being found that makes them good you know and we're not going to understand it comprehensively but that's the problem of using a variational circuit you know you, you don't end up with an intuitive picture but we would like to understand it better and it may be exactly as you say that we're able to understand that uh, the nature of the state as having some code-like properties that make it uh, susceptible to the thing we want and uh, robust against the stuff we don't want which is the noise so I guess I would have to glance over a, a balance to see if that's a paper he's familiar with, but if not, it's something that we need to read into to try and understand what we're seeing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let's uh, thank uh, Simon again.